Good morning and happy Friday. I'm Stephen Romo in for Joe and Savannah today. And right now on Morning News Now, one year of war, a historic milestone for Ukraine, Russia and the world. Today marks one year since Russian forces invaded Ukraine, setting off a conflict that's killed hundreds of thousands of people, displaced millions and reshaped the world as we know it. Now, with no end in sight, both sides are sending a message that they will prevail. And here in America, the war taking a toll on the economy, with major corporations under pressure to cut ties with Russia. We have team coverage this morning. His own defense, dramatic developments in the double murder trial of Alec Murdoch, as Murdoch himself takes the witness stand and breaks down, admitting that he lied to investigators about where he was when his wife and son were killed, but denying that he was the one who killed them. I didn't shoot my wife or my son anytime, ever. I would never intentionally do anything to hurt either one of them. We'll have highlights from his testimony and how it could affect his case. Wild winter this morning, millions of Americans waking up to unusual weather from snow at the Hollywood sign to surfing in Michigan. We're tracking down conditions from coast to coast, plus what to expect where you live this weekend. And twinning this morning, something to celebrate for these twin sisters, both set to graduate high school at the top of their class. We'll talk to them about their amazing accomplishments and what's in store for their future. A lot to get to this morning. Thanks for being here. And we begin this morning in Ukraine, that country marking one year since Russian forces invaded, sparking Europe's largest conflict since World War II. On this day in 2022, Russian tanks and military vehicles rolled into Ukraine to begin what President Putin described as a, quote, special military operation. Since then, hundreds of thousands of people are estimated to have died in the fighting that's followed. Despite Russia's slower than expected progress, its forces have been able to capture large swaths of eastern Ukraine, known as the Donbass region, which became the stage for some of the fiercest battles of the war. Across Ukraine, ceremonies are being held to mark the somber milestone. And earlier this morning, a defiant President Volodymyr Zelensky told his people that Ukraine will, quote, defeat all threats. It was a year of endurance, a year of compassion, a year of bravery, a year of pain, a year of hope, a year of perseverance, a year of unity, a year of invincibility, a fierce year of invincibility. Its main conclusion is that we have survived. We have not been defeated and we will do everything to win this year. Well, in just a few moments, we'll hear from NBC News business and data reporter Brian Chung and NBC News military analyst Colonel Jack Jacobs. But before that, let's get to NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin, who joins us from Kyiv with the latest. Aaron. Hey, Stephen. Well, today is a somber day here in the capital and across Ukraine. Ukrainians are taking a moment to remember the thousands of lives lost in this war. There were a number of ceremonies, not only here at St. Michael's Cathedral in the heart of Kyiv behind me, but also in the city of Bucha and beyond. So many lives have been changed by this war, including the family of Alina Ulyanova. I actually met her in the days prior to the war. She was out at what they had organized, some sort of neighborhood training camp where ordinary Ukrainians were learning first aid, learning how to fire a weapon in preparation for a possible invasion. It was there that I asked Alina if she was afraid for her boys, given in all of these dire assessments that were playing out coming from Washington, D.C., coming from the West, that there was an imminent full-scale invasion. And she responded to me that what matters most is dignity, if you have it or not, when you die. Fast forward a year later, I sat down with her again. So much for her has changed. She lost her job. She lost her home. One of her teenage boys has now gone to live in France. And I asked her the same question. Are you scared? Take a listen to how she answered. I'm scared for them like every moment and every second. But I learned that uh, life is not evil. 
like to us. And even most like uh, weird and dangerous situations, they can play uh, for good and you can learn something from them if you survive uh, and you become stronger. And on this grim anniversary, so many Ukrainians, whether they be civilians or military, say they're scared, Stephen. Yeah, Aaron, it's uh, so valuable to stay with certain people and follow them through this process. Meanwhile, we know fighting, of course, continues to rage in eastern Ukraine. What's the situation like there on the ground? Well, there are contrasting approaches to this war when you look at what the Russians doing and what are doing and what you look at when you look at what the Ukrainians are doing. Military experts say Russia is really playing right now for a war of attrition. According to the British Ministry of Defense, they put out their assessment this morning. They believe that the Russians are trying to buy time. They're not going for large swaths of Ukrainian territory at this point. What they're trying to do is where the Ukrainian military military down in the hopes that that Western support in the long run ultimately f fades, knowing that they have more manpower, that they have more natural resources. Ukraine is taking a vastly different approach. They see this as a window of opportunity, given the Western support, given the military support that's coming from the United States, another uh, round of military support announced this morning in terms of ammunition. They see this as an opportunity. They know they've been able to defeat the Russians in the battle for Kyiv, the battle for Kharkiv, the battle for Kherson, and they really feel confident in their ability, should they get that ammunition, should they get those promised weapons, to be able to push the Russians out of their territory. And I was speaking to a senior advisor to President Zelensky who was telling me that he believes that this could be accomplished uh, within the next year. All right, Aaron McLaughlin, thanks so much for breaking it down for us. And now let's bring in NBC News military analyst Colonel Jack Jacobs. Colonel Jacobs, thanks so much for being here this morning. Of course, we've, talk, we've spoken to you many times over the past year about the situation in Ukraine. What do you think about the state of the war right now, and how has it changed since this invasion started a year ago? Well, it looks pretty much like a stalemate right now. Uh, th this is not the season for making attacks. Uh, it's cold, it's muddy on either side of the roads, uh, and the Ukrainians are still waiting to, for more Western equipment and to be trained on the Western equipment that they're going to get. Um, the Russians are continuing to do what they do best, which is to bombard Ukrainian cities, infrastructure, power plants, and so on. The Ukrainians, meanwhile, are waiting to get Western equipment and to gear up for what they hope will be a decisive offensive sometime in the coming year. But it's going to be difficult for the Ukrainians because the Russians are strongly uh, arrayed on the eastern side of the river. And for any attack, you need at least a three to one ratio in order to be successful if you're making the attack. And it becomes much more difficult if you're going to have to cross the river. The Russians, for their part, are confident, as you, we've heard and we've talked about many times, that they can outlast the West. They can outlast Ukraine and ultimately they'll be able to outlast the uh, conviction of America's allies to continue to support Ukraine, that the West will eventually get tired, will run out of money or decide they don't want to spend that much money, and the Ukrainians will be left to their own devices. So this next year, but particularly the next six months, will be decisive. Ukraine waiting for more help, but Russia could be looking at getting some help, too. There have been concerns over China's potential role in the war, possibly coming to Russia's side. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has said that there is intelligence showing that China is considering sending lethal aid, That and that they do that, they could be facing some real consequences if they did. So what did that response, what do you think that would look like? Well, it's, it's sort of a strange relationship, isn't it? Russia and China, who've been at odds for a long, long time, but uh, one supposes that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. But China has been warned by us and by others that if they do that, they are going to face consequences, and they're most likely to be economic consequences. Now, the Chinese may think that they might be able to weather this, but uh, it, it's not going to be to their particular advantage to assist the Russians. And the principal reason for that is that the Chinese are very much dependent upon economic relationships with the West in order to survive, and the Chinese currently have 
difficult problems, particularly economic problems, internally. So the risk-adjusted return on, a, on the Chinese assisting the Russians uh, is not particularly attractive. They lose a lot more by doing that than they gain by doing that. And the likelihood is that they probably will not do extensive, give extensive aid to the Russians. But it remains to be seen. She is in a difficult situation. Uh, he may try to do it in order to shore up his internal support, but it's going to be economically extremely difficult for China if it does so. Of course, yet to be seen if China is making that same calculation. Colonel Jack Jacobs, thanks so much. And when the war started a year ago, there was a strong push, especially for U.S.-based businesses, to cut ties with Russia. Well, a lot of those companies have closed their offices in Russia. A few did stick around. NBC News business and data reporter Brian Chung took a look at the 30 biggest multinational companies and what their involvement is in the country one year since that public push to withdraw. He joins us at the big board now for more on what he found. Brian, good morning. Thanks for being here. So exactly how many American headquartered businesses are still in Russia? And are there any surprises on this list? Yeah, good morning, Stephen. One year out from the invasion of Ukraine, we've seen a lot of the large U.S. multinational corporations pull out of the country. We did an analysis of the 30 U.S. stocks that are in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, seen to be the blue chip largest companies in America. And among those 30, 24 of them said they had businesses in Russia and either exited or suspended their businesses there. So among the companies that have said they have temporarily suspended their businesses, you're looking at Apple no longer selling their products there. Coca-Cola no, no, no longer selling their products there. Boeing no longer providing parts in the region. Very interesting to also see how this differs from the companies that have said not only are, there, are they stopping their businesses, but they're actually leaving the country entirely. Here are some countries or companies that have exited their businesses in Russia, looking at Honeywell, a J.P. Morgan Chase and Goldman Sachs, in many cases due to U.S. sanctions, not only stopping their businesses, but also leaving uh, the country. Nike, McDonald's among the companies that are also saying they're going to unroll and then actually leave the country entirely. Now, there are some companies that have said that they have uh, they still have some business ties there, although they are actually partially suspending parse portions of their business as well. Take a look at Amgen, Johnson & Johnson, Merck. These are a pharmaceutical and health companies that are saying they're continuing to provide essential medicines to the Russian people. Although you look at the likes of Procter & Gamble, this is a consumer-facing business that said they are continuing to provide uh, some essential uh, types of health care, or not health care, but rather uh, cleaning and hygiene products to the region as well. Dow Chemicals saying they pared back their operations, and Chevron saying they have limited exposure to Russia, but they do have a stake in a Kazakh pipeline that does transact with Russia. So very interesting to see how a lot of these large companies, for the most part, are pulling out and leaving Russia. Yeah, they are or, or seem like they're trying to. Meanwhile, restaurants and shops operating in Russia, they got a lot of attention, especially in the media, when Russian-owned businesses tried to sort of step in and fill that gap when those companies were fleeing. How are those businesses doing? Yeah, well, I mean, if I just show you some of the uh, companies that have decided to leave the country entirely, I mean, a lot of these companies have actually put a number on how much it costs them to leave. When you take a look at J.P. Morgan Chase, for example, Jamie Dimon, the CEO there, saying that it's going to cost them rough, it could cost them a billion dollars. Uh, for leaving the country. McDonald's, somewhere between $1.2 and $1.4 billion. And then also Honeywell saying that it could cost them $295 million uh, in terms of charges to leave the country. So there's a lot of money that's associated with this, but they said for the reputational risk, it's just simply not worth it, Stephen. All right, Brian Chung, thanks for breaking that down for us. All right, now let's get to the latest on the Alec Murdoch double murder trial. Murdoch will take the stand today again to continue to be cross-examined by prosecutors. He took the stand yesterday in his own defense, denying he shot and killed his wife and one of his sons. NBC News correspondent Katie Beck is following the trial and has the latest from Walterboro, South Carolina. Alec Murdoch's defense team making the risky and rare decision to put their client on the stand. Will it help or hurt their case? The jury now tasked to decide. After nearly five weeks of testimony, a stunning surprise. I am going to testify. I want to testify. The trial's most anticipated witness takes the stand. Alec Murdoch testifies in his own defense. The first questions aimed at the heart of the case. Did you take this gun or any gun like it and blow your son's brains out on June 7th or any day or any time? No, I did not. 
you, you take a 300 blackout such as this and fire it into your wife Maggie's leg, torso, or any part of her body? No, I did not. Quick to confront what is perhaps the prosecution's strongest evidence, the video taken by Paul Murdoch at the dog kennels, placing Alec at the crime scene minutes before the murders. He's told investigators he wasn't there, but admits now he was lying. Alec, why did you lie? As my addiction evolved over time, I would get in these situations or circumstances where I would get paranoid. Murdoch says he didn't trust state law enforcers and regrets the lie that led to many others. Did you continue lying after that night? Did you not? But once I lied, I continued to lie, yes, sir. Emotional and crying throughout, Murdoch's testimony largely rewrites his timeline on the night of the murders, showering and changing clothes before dinner, and describing the moment he discovered the bodies, again saying he checked for signs of life. I know I tried to turn him over. When you say you tried to turn him over, what, why were you trying to turn him over? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why I tried to turn him over. Me and my boys laying face down. Later in testimony, Alec admits a longtime addiction to opioids, that he stole client funds, but denies being overly concerned about getting caught prior to the murders. What kind of uh, cases did you normally do? On cross-examination, prosecutors began by pressing Murdoch on the fraud cases, where he admits he stole money from his clients and lied to them. And prosecutors suggesting all the stolen money wasn't going to fund his pill addiction. You were generating millions of dollars in fees. That was not enough for you. Would you concede that? If, if by concede that, you mean was I also stealing money that I shouldn't have? Yes, sir, I agree with that. I've said that repeatedly. Katie Beck reporting there. Murdoch testified for about six hours yesterday before court adjourned for the day. The defense team says it has two more witnesses to call before they rest their case. And for more on the Murdoch trial, we're joined by NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Danny, thanks for being here this morning. Wanted to talk to you about this. I did not think he would he would actually take the stand, but of course he did take the stand. What did you think? Was that the right decision? Was it the right decision? We don't know yet. We'll find out when the verdict comes back. But there were a lot of problems. You generally don't call your client unless you absolutely have to get something from him you can't get from anywhere else. I'm not sure we heard anything new. He's already denied what he did on video interrogation. Uh, he's already, we've already seen him give his story on plenty of different videos. So what did we get new from here? I'm not entirely sure. Remember, the defense spent a lot of time pointing at the prosecution and saying they did a lousy job investigating. They got tunnel vision, Stephen, and they focused on our client. And the data was wrong. They had bad uh, geographic data. They had all kinds of bad data. Then Murdoch takes the stand and he says, oh, no, they were right. They, they essentially got tunnel vision and there were no other tunnels. Uh, so at the end of the day, the defense hasn't put on any evidence to dispute three essential facts. Number one, Murdoch was there at the crime scene. He was the only one police found at the crime scene. Number two, he handled a firearm. And number three, he has lied constantly. He didn't just lie about the financial crimes. He lied about what he told law enforcement. And I can already hear the prosecution's closing. If he lied to, pro to law enforcement, how do you know he's not lying to you now? Was he lying then or is he lying to you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury? Yeah. Seems like a long shot. Yeah, not long after he took the stand, he did make that admission uh, to lying. I was wondering exactly how jurors would feel about that, hurting his credibility. We do have a clip. Let's play that and get your opinion on the other side. I wasn't thinking clearly. I don't think I was capable of reason. And I lied about being down there. Once I lied, I continued to lie. Yes, sir. Why? You know, oh, what a tangled web we weave. A tangled web we weave. He, I couldn't believe he actually said those words because I was thinking that same thing. Would jurors, how they would try to interpret this, he went on to lie about uh, stealing money and that he had to do that as well. What do you think the defense's strategy is there? Here's the thing. He completely lied about the timeline. And I have to ask you, this is what I think they should say in closing if you're the state. 
If he hadn't been caught in this lie by the data, by the other technological information, do you honestly think he would have taken the stand and said, oh, by the way, I know there's no evidence that I lied, but I lied. I was really there. No, he's now telling his version of the truth because he got caught. And that's what prosecutors should focus on. So what? He admits to his financial crimes. We know that he already has committed these financial crimes. He admits to lying to law enforcement. We already know that. Any Anyone who's been watching this trial saw him lie, but he wasn't discovered until the prosecution had to do extra footwork, get all this data that he surely wasn't aware existed, uh, and now he's getting caught. And the jury can see that, and the prosecution, they've got to hammer that in the closing. All the defense really has at the end of the day in their closing is those guys did a shoddy investigation, but they can't dispute the fact, they can't put on a real third-party defense. In other words, they've suggested that maybe the shooter wasn't tall enough or that there were people who wanted to do his son Paul harm, but they haven't pointed to an empty chair and said, there's some other dude out there, and here's the dude. Yeah, an alternate uh, explanation. Oh, well, there's more to come. Cross-examination continues today. Danny, thanks so much. All right, now to the late winter blast hitting much of the country from California to Maine. Devastating snow, wind, and ice caused massive power outages, car pileups, and a whole lot of travel delays. Thousands of flights were canceled as people were urged not to travel due to low visibility, high winds, and icy road conditions. Almost one million people in the state of Michigan have been left without power due to downed lines. Other states are dealing with the after effects of blizzards. Minnesota seeing 15 inches of snow on the ground. Portland, Oregon, recording its second largest snowfall ever. And look at this. In Southern California, a blizzard warning was issued for the first time since 1989, with flurries bringing a rainbow over Hollywood. Angela Aspen joins us now with more on that. Some wild weather out there, Angela. You took the words right out of my mouth. I was going to say exactly that. Wild weather this week, and it continues to be impactful for a lot of people now on the West Coast. We dealt with uh, many of that, many of those issues, here, I should say, from the plains to the Northeast over the past few days. Now we're centering all of our attention over mainly California. Yesterday, Oregon picked up its second snowiest day in records. Uh, we're going to see some, Im some impacts as far as snow and rain and wind. All of those things are going to be something that folks in California are going to have to deal with through the day today. So let's time it out for you. There's the, the system that we're watching. It's already started to bring some heavy rain to parts of the Bay Area and points north. As we get through today, Los Angeles, San Diego, Santa Barbara, all those locations are going to see more rainfall and it will be concerning for flooding conditions. You can see where the best chance of some flash flooding is. Uh, Santa Ana, LA, Malibu, Thousand Oaks, Santa Barbara, you're going to be in on this as well. We know that there's issue with the, the, the ground saturation when we see ample amounts of rain, so I wouldn't be surprised if we see some flooded roadways. And on top of that, we'll see some difficult travel, too, when it comes to strong winds and snow. There's the rainfall amounts that you can expect near L.A., two, three, even upwards of four inches in some spots. Isolated amounts could be even higher than that across the area. Snowfall, it's going to be more focused towards those higher elevations, of course. Anywhere from three to six feet is likely in parts of the Sierras, but there will be a chance for lower elevations, say 2,000 feet, to see uh, some of that accumulating snow snowfall as well. So that'll be something that we likely haven't seen in a while and we don't often see. So we'll we'll watch for some videos, photos to come out of that. It'll be pretty interesting in places like what you just saw where the Hollywood Hills sign uh, where the Hollywood sign is and then the Hollywood Hills. We do continue to have uh, issues as far as impacts in that area. You can see the, the high wind warning that's in effect in that area along with the wind advisory. 30 million people are included in this and that's because our wind gusts will be 30, 40, even 50 miles per hour with snow. That means blowing snow and visibility will be an issue for really a, a lot of folks as we get through the next couple of days, Stephen. All right, so much going on and so much to look forward to. Angie, thank you. Well, coming up on Morning News Now, new concerns about a migrant crisis, this time at the northern border. We'll look into what's behind a 700% spike in crossings from Canada. Plus, tensions rising in the Middle East following that deadly raid this week in the West Bank. More on the new efforts underway to keep peace. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Border Patrol agents are seeing an increase in migrants coming into the United States from Canada. As NBC News correspondent Valerie Castro explains, some areas are seeing a 700% spike in people crossing from the northern border. 
a new border crisis. Migrants crossing over under the cover of darkness in the extreme weather, in some cases dying. Pete Foster has watched it play out from his own home. I think it's sad. I think that'd be an awful position to put your kids and your family in crossing like that, but obviously these people don't feel they have a choice. Foster is not talking about the southern border, but the north where the U.S. meets Canada, less than 100 yards from his front door in Vermont. How cold does it get up here? Oh, I've seen it 20 below zero. No condition to be walking through the woods at night? <laughs> no, especially not with your family, you know. He's lived here for more than 20 years. Recently, there's been a noticeable change. Is there a lack of Border Patrol presence here? Um, last couple of years, there's been a real lack of agents. Um, and I would say yes, a real lack of Border Patrol presence. This area, the U.S. Customs and Border Protection's Swanton sector, stretches across New York, Vermont, and New Hampshire. CBP citing a more than 800% increase in apprehensions and encounters there from October to January of this year, compared to the same time the previous year. Turn left onto the ramp to Canadian border. Right now we're headed to an area of the border with Canada and Vermont where Border Patrol agents tell us uh, it's been a hot spot for migrants making their way into the U.S. illegally. They've been crossing over through wooded areas and through some extremely cold weather over the last month. But Foster worries it's not just migrants who are crossing. He says suspicious cars are showing up in the middle of the night and also says he's seen what he believes could be evidence of drug trafficking. Yeah, there's some serious people that come across. It's not all just families trying to get in. Swanton sector border agents documenting several cases of migrants walking into the country, bracing bitter cold while dragging suitcases and carrying children. In this case, an eight-month-old and a two-year-old. The sector's chief patrol agent, Robert Garcia, tweeting that during a week in early February, 105 people from eight countries were apprehended, quote, undeterred by Arctic chill, despite regional temps dropping to minus 22. Another photo would appears to be a bare footprint in the snow. Sometimes the dangerous trek turns deadly. Last year, a South Asian couple, including their two children, froze to death, attempting to cross into the U.S. from Canada near North Dakota. Their bodies were found just 13 yards away from the border. It tells me that the cartels have recognized that there's an awful lot of profit to be made coming through, through the northern border. And they're going to do whatever is necessary to generate that profit. And when you see numbers like this, that's clearly showing that they've seen a vulnerability. They know that there's gaps in our coverage, and they're going to exploit those gaps for that profit. Brandon Judd, president of the union that represents border agents, says cartels trafficking everything from illicit drugs to human beings are facilitating the path north, booking flights for a fee. The cartels facilitate um, the entire travel for a fee um, from Mexico to Canada. Uh, and then from Canada to the United States. It's, it's all about fees, but they do facilitate the entire travel, yes. But not far from Pete Foster's home, migrants are also going the other way, walking into Canada at this unofficial border crossing on Roxham Road, taken into custody by Canadian officials, hoping they'll be accepted as refugees. La gente entró en desesperación, se corrieron los rumores de que llegaban buses para subirte a Canadá. First it was slow, then it started picking up and picking up, and now it's worse than ever. There's constant people either walking or personal vehicles or all kinds of taxis from cars to vans. Melissa Bishaw lives on Roxham Road, the traffic prompting her to add security measures to her home. There's one camera there, a second camera's there, and a third camera's there, and then I got a fourth camera in the back on the back porch. More than 39,000 refugees crossed into Canada last year through unofficial crossings. The majority took this path. The Canadian government now struggling to deal with the influx. It would be unfortunate to put up barricades and close Roxham Road only for border crossings to open up elsewhere along the 6,000 or so kilometers of border that we have with the United States. On the U.S. side, Pete Foster just wants help starting with more border protection. I think it'll help. I think what they have for agents here are stretched very thin. Um, I think it would definitely help having more agents.
And our thanks to Valerie Castro for that report. U.S. Customs and Border Protection would not respond to claims that they are stretched too thin along the northern border, but say there are 273 agents assigned to that sector. The union telling NBC News agents have been asked to volunteer to report to the northern border in the next month to address some of those issues, but CBP would not confirm that request for more manpower. All right, to the latest now in the developments in the Middle East, where tensions are running high this morning after Israel and militants in the Gaza Strip exchanged fire yesterday. It's the latest violence following a deadly raid in the West Bank on Wednesday that was carried out by the Israeli army. NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter has been following this story, and she joins us now with more. Molly, good morning to you. So what's the latest on the situation there? Stephen, good morning to you. So I think that we can report there is a, a qu cautious quiet this morning. Uh, there were no new rockets fired from Gaza. There were no airstrikes, Israeli airstrikes uh, in Gaza overnight. There was some expectation there might be big Palestinian protests in the occupied West Bank or in East Jerusalem after Friday prayers. Stephen, we have not seen that yet. But just to be really clear, as you mentioned, that deadly raid in Nablus, we are at the tail end of a week of the deadliest week that the occupied West Bank has seen in nearly 20 years. So there's no sign that we are kind of in the clear or out of this cycle of violence yet. And speaking of that, Reuters is reporting that these uh, mediation efforts that are underway by Egypt and the United Nations to try to calm the situation that they're ongoing right now. Do we know where those efforts stand? And has Israeli leader Benjamin Netanyahu, has he shown any signs that he's willing to try to negotiate for a solution? Yeah, Stephen, no word on those mediation efforts or even what kind of the goal or the possible outcomes or solutions of kind of mediation efforts at this point might be. We do know the Middle East uh, UN envoy went into Gaza yesterday uh, for meetings. He did tweet out a statement. He said, deeply disturbed by the continuing cycle of violence and appalled by the loss of civilian lives. Continuing my engagement with all concerned parties to de-escalate the situation, I urge all sides to refrain from steps that could further inflame an already volatile situation. Uh, no sign, Stephen, though, that these meetings might bring different results. For example, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu's government has shown no sign uh, that they will change course or stop uh, the direction that they have been going since he came back into power, of course, leading the most right-wing government uh, that Israel has ever seen. We have seen more of these raids, of course, just several weeks ago. We were talking about the deadly raid in Janine, Stephen, now Nablus. We have seen uh, an increase in home demolitions in East Jerusalem. So no sign that the Israeli side is doing anything differently. And really looking at the Palestinian Authority, President Mahmoud Abbas runs a very, very weak government. He has no trust, no mandate among the Palestinian people, Stephen. And where does the U.S. stand in all of this? Is there any indication the U.S. might try to step in and prevent this from escalating more? Well, remember, Secretary of State uh, Antony Blinken was just in the region. He was on a pre-scheduled trip, and it actually coincided uh, with that deadly raid in Janine in the occupied West Bank just a few weeks ago. Uh, he went to try to kind of tamp down tensions. Of course, clearly that didn't work because then we saw this very deadly week uh, this week in Nablus. There was a statement, very boilerplate statement from the U.S. State Department yesterday. Take a listen uh, to Ned Price. The United States is extremely concerned by the levels of violence in Israel and the West Bank. We recognize the very real security concerns facing Israel. At the same time, we are deeply concerned by the large number of injuries and the loss of civilian lives. Yeah, so deeply concerned about the civilian uh, le loss of life. Of course, 11 Palestinians, including militants and civilians, uh, lost their lives uh, this week. The real difference, though, this week and why this is so different uh, than Janine and why talking to people on both sides uh, really doubt that any kind of calm may come of this is the civilian casualties, the civilian injuries, Stephen. More than 100 Palestinians were injured in the raid in Nablus and many of those from live ammunition. So really no trust, uh, certainly on the Palestinian side, that anyone, including the U.S. in the international community, has the leverage, would use the leverage uh, to get the Israeli government, led by Prime Minister Netanyahu, to change course uh, or to not uh, carry out more of these uh, very deadly, very similar raids. A complicated situation, a lot of violence. Molly, thanks for helping us break that down. Well, coming up this morning, new information about that Ohio train derailment now posing a health hazard and a whole lot of concern for residents. What investigators are now saying may have been the cause of that accident. That's up next on Morning News Now.
Welcome back. And now for the latest on that toxic threat facing an Ohio community following a train derailment earlier this month. New findings from the NTSB are revealing a possible cause for that accident. NBC News correspondent Ron Allen has those details. With the scene being cleaned up, new details about what caused the fiery derailment. Federal investigators saying a preliminary investigation shows an overheated wheel bearing likely to blame. This was 100% Preventable. The NTSB says the train passed over two detectors, which showed the bearing was heating up. By the time it hit a third detector, it was 253 degrees above air temperature, triggering an audible alarm to warn the crew, who then slowed and stopped the train. This is a community that is suffering. This is not about politics. What I care about is figuring out how this happened. The NTSB chair says there's no evidence the crew did anything wrong. In a statement, Norfolk Southern says our highest priority is the safety of our people and the communities we serve, adding it will continue to support the NTSB's investigation. While Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg visited for the first time after criticism from some residents that he should have come sooner, demanding the nation's rail operators stop resisting safety measures to cut costs. Let's get people from both sides of the aisle to the table and come to agreement on some steps that, that are needed, even if uh, the rail industry is pushing back. Meanwhile, near the crash, the Figleys only come back to their small farm to check on things like their chickens. They're part of a class action lawsuit that attorneys say includes over 500 residents. I live out of my car and at my daughter's house. It's awful. I feel homeless. Why won't you come back home? Because I, I, I don't know what I'm coming home to, and I'm 70 years old. And the number of lawsuits is growing, at least a dozen, that attorneys say could ultimately involve thousands of residents in Ohio and Pennsylvania affected by the derailment. Norfolk Southern has said it will not comment on any pending litigation. Now back to you. No doubt it's just the beginning. Ron, thank you. All right, now to an update on Harvey Weinstein. The former Hollywood producer has been sentenced to 16 more years in prison for a rape conviction in Los Angeles. The disgraced film producer and media mogul was already serving a more than two decade long sentence for a separate sex crime conviction in New York. That case was considered to be a landmark trial for the Me Too movement. Weinstein's attorney says his new sentence will be appealed. Well, coming up this morning, the politics of black history. After the break, we'll hear from a journalist behind a new push to educate people about African-Americans' painful past and some politicians' efforts to stop it. And all in the family, we'll introduce you to two sisters, both graduating high school at the very top of their class. This is Morning News Now. Welcome back. As Americans celebrate Black History Month, some political leaders are fighting against its inclusion in the classroom. NBC News correspondent Zen Clay Esimwa sat down with the author of the 1619 Project to discuss the politics of black history. Journalist and creator of the 1619 Project, Nicole Hannah-Jones, is no stranger to criticism. You have called yourself a symbol for people who wanted to stoke the so-called culture wars. Yes. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, clearly, you can look at just last week when Nikki Haley decides she wants to announce presidency, she includes the 1619 Project in that announcement and includes it in ways that are not accurate and very disparaging of the project. The long-form journalism project, launched in 2019 by the New York Times Magazine, re-examines U.S. history through the lens of the African-American experience and is now a Hulu docu-series. Hannah Jones says her project spawned a larger so-called anti-critical race theory campaign in the country. Earlier this month, 1619 was referenced in former Governor Nikki Haley's bid for the Republican nomination. They say the promise of freedom is just made up. Some think our ideas are not just wrong, but racist and evil. What is your response to Nikki Haley's video calling out your project and making those claims? One, I don't think anyone can read the project and argue that uh, the project thinks America is evil. Nikki Haley herself really erases and invisibilizes how the black freedom struggle allowed her to be in a position to run for president. The project, also cited by Republican Governor Ron DeSantis, yeah. 
as a reason for his controversial Stop Woke Act. The legislation restricts teaching on race and sexuality in Florida schools. The documentary series premiered just as Florida's controversial ban of advanced placement African American history classes began. Do you have a message to these mostly Republican governors who are banning 1619 and other race-related education? Yes, I mean, my message to these governors is, uh, one, have you actually read the 1619 Project? Our children deserve to be exposed to all types of different ideas. This is the role of a public education. Former Governor Nikki Haley did not immediately respond for comment. The DeSantis administration declined to comment on this matter. The film series also expands on the Pulitzer Prize-winning 1619 Project, including episodes on democracy, music, capitalism, and more. Hannah Jones infusing her own family story throughout. You can't understand democracy without realizing that our founders didn't actually believe in multiracial democracy, but black people did. Hannah Jones hoping 1619's story of America's complicated past will bring a brighter future. Zinclair Samoa, NBC News. Important topics in Clay, thanks. Some financial headlines now. Credit card debt could be crippling rainy day funds nationwide. CNBC Sylvana Hanau joins us for this and more money news. Good morning, Sylvana. Hey, Stephen. Good morning. That's right. So, yeah, credit card debt is hurting Americans' ability to stash money away for a rainy day. A new bank rate survey finds more than a third of people say their debt is larger than their emergency savings, and one in four say they'd have to use their credit cards to cover a $1,000 expense. Saving for an emergency has been challenging amid high inflation and rising interest rates. Nearly 40% of people say they either have less money in savings versus a year ago or none at all. Chinese e-commerce giant Alibaba has yet to see a full consumer-led rebound. The company runs two of the largest online shopping sites in China. On Alibaba's earnings call yesterday, CEO Daniel Zhang says sales of physical goods have remained weak so far this year. That's due to COVID cases as well as people traveling during the Lunar New Year holidays. But he says after the COVID wave and holiday, demand for apparel, sporting and outdoor goods recovered. Warner Brothers is Warner Brothers Discovery is taking a page from Disney's playbook saying it will lean heavily into its popular franchises including Superman, Batman, Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter. The company says after completing months of restructuring, it's looking to take full advantage of its roster of characters through new movies and TV shows. It struck a deal to make several films based on the Lord of the Rings novel, Stephen. Okay, more superhero movies and TV yep. shows. I will not complain about that. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, Savannah, thanks so much. All right, well, our next story is the true definition of twin power. Sisters Gloria and Victoria Guerre were have been named the valedictorian and salutatorian at West Hempstead Secondary School, an exclamation point to just some remarkable high school careers. And the sisters join us now to talk all about it. I love hearing this so much. Thank you both, Gloria and Victoria, for being with us this morning. This is such an amazing feat, not just one of you, but both of you. How did you react when you found out about this? So it was totally unexpected, the announcement. I was in AP Physics just doing momentum problems. Um, and it was a rainy day, pretty chilly. I didn't uh, expect anything. And um, when the announcement came over the PA, they announced salutatorian first. And uh, when they announced my name, I immediately went out of the room. Um, I was running around the hallways in complete shock. But I had to run back in to hear Gloria's name. <laughs> and when Gloria's name was announced, we were both just jumping in the classroom, mm -hmm. completely in disregard of anybody um, watching us. Uh, we were just so surprised. And this moment is just so precious to us. Yeah, for me, it felt so surreal. Um, I had this um, achievement as a target for a long time. And for it to actually come into fruition, it just felt so surreal. I'm so happy. <laughs> Yeah, what an incredible moment for you to remember the rest of your lives together. So how did you both uh, push and motivate each other? A lot of people would think about a certain type of uh, sibling rivalry that you guys may have, but it seems like you just are each other's support systems. It's exactly that. Um, I say all the time, but iron sharpens iron. I really believe we use each other to push ourselves and improve upon our skills. I know that if she received a grade and I didn't like mine, I would get mad and I would try to you know, compete to be like her. And it was just back and forth and it really helped us shape to her today. Yeah, and we use our strengths and uh, weaknesses to our advantage. We know that um, she's a little better at some subjects 
and I'm a little better at others. For example, I struggled in algebra, but she was able to help me out in that subject. And she struggles in essay writing, so I help her out all the time in that too. So we just use each other's strengths to um, our advantage to help each other's weaknesses. Wow. Well, we uh, do want to ask you, what's next for you? Of course, uh, college uh, seems like it's definitely something you guys are thinking about. I heard you casually mention AP physics there. So what's in store? <laughs> well, immediately, I, we have a lot of things on our athletic agenda. Um, we have state championships coming up next Saturday, nationals. Uh, for academics, we do have AP exams. Uh, we're taking six APs this year, so that's going to be a lot. But uh, how about for college? For the next four years, we uh, plan to pursue, um, continue our athletic and academic careers at Yale University. And we hope to study uh, artificial intelligence. And we may diverge uh, during our study, but that's the goal for now. Wow, fascinating. Definitely want to follow all of that. You guys also uh, athletes, in addition to being incredible at academics, such an inspiration. Victoria and Gloria, thanks so much for being with us this morning. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us. All right, well, coming up this morning on Morning News Now, musicians with a mission. When we come back, as we mark one year of the war in Ukraine, how a Ukrainian orchestra is spreading a message of hope here in the United States. We'll be back. Welcome back. After 50 years, we are finally going to find out what happened after The Grinch Stole Christmas. Publishers are releasing a brand new book called How the Grinch Lost Christmas. It takes place one year after the first, and of course, it'll teach another valuable lesson about the true spirit of the holiday season. With the original book being a huge success and being adapted into live action and animated films, it is no surprise The Grinch will be returning to Whoville. We can expect the holidays to come a bit sooner. This year, that book is scheduled to be released on September 5th. Very cool. A lot of questions about what happens next. And finally this hour, while Ukraine's military is now one year into a vital mission fending off Russia's invasion, Ukrainian musicians are on a different mission. They're touring America, promoting Ukraine's rich culture, a tour that last week brought them to New York and one of America's most iconic concert halls. Our Joe Fryer has more. These are the civilized sounds one would expect to hear in a revered venue like Carnegie Hall. Harmonious music performed by the Lviv National Philharmonic Orchestra. Yet a much more raucous sound sometimes seems to erupt as these Ukrainian musicians tour America. You walk on the stage in Miami, the orchestra, even before the conductor shows any signs of life, the orchestra walks out and you'd think it's, it's a tie score with five seconds left in the Super Bowl. The public is stamping their feet, they're screaming. Many of them have small Ukrainian flags in their pockets, and they're not Ukrainians. They're normal American concert goers. You know, that never happened to me before when you go on stage and there is a standing ovation already. And I kind of feel a little bit uncomfortable in a way because this is not for me. That response is for the orchestra but it's not about the orchestra. What it's about is their homeland. Just ask Ukrainian-born pianist Stanislav Krestenko, who has family fighting in the war. Those are the heroes, and I'm getting a standing ovation. I don't think this is fair, but I kind of dedicate all this because we all understand who are the real heroes today. The orchestra's tour was actually planned two years ago, well before anyone could have imagined a war in Europe. Their Ukrainian-American conductor, Theodore Kuchar, says 66 musicians are here, but they're preoccupied with what's happening to the loved ones they've left behind. There's nobody here who is not intimately familiar with somebody who has been impacted in the worst possible way by this. So people are highly distracted by what's happening, but they realize also that their existence in the United States, in Carnegie Hall this evening, somebody has put them on a very special mission, and I think they are serving their country as they are best able to right now. What is that mission? The mission, I think, is to show Americans that the country that they are supporting. It's not a band of poor, soulless people. It is intellectually, culturally equal to any of its European counterparts. A mission to share Ukraine's culture with the world, eclipsing images of war with sounds.
of harmony. This is a historic moment for all Ukrainians. I'm not sure that every musician realizes it, but I think in 20 or 30 years, when they're sitting and reflecting on their careers, where they've been, what they've done, there's no question that this evening will represent the culmination of what Ukrainian musical life has achieved up until this point. Just beautiful. And our thanks to Joe Fryer for that report. One of the songs performed during last week's show came from a Ukrainian composer. This tour by the Lviv National Philharmonic is making stops in 40 cities all across America. It started last month in Florida and ends next month in Iowa. Well, that's going to do it for this hour of morning news now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.